Morning, everybody. What a facility. I'm impressed. I'm taking a lot of pictures outside. <laughs> I'm sending back to my staff. We need to get busy. <laughs> I'm provoked to good works. Uh, Financial Peace University uh, will change your life. Um, if you think you don't need it, you're the one that needs it. Uh, one of my daughters is uh, the associate editor for Dave Ramsey in Franklin, Tennessee, and uh, we're moving up the food chain. And uh, so all my kids have jobs, and they're out of the house, and married off. God bless them. Because the goal of having kids is to get them gone. <laughs> yeah, you laugh, and I'm serious. <laughs> so uh, all my kids left. They're doing really good, so we love every one of them. Uh, I got remarried about six years ago. Uh, love my life went to heaven uh, unexpectedly, and uh, uh, 45 years of marriage, and it was incredible. Dropped six babies out of that thing. Should have dropped 20. I don't know why we didn't have more. And uh, so I wanted a big family. My dad had 12 brothers and sisters, so did my father-in-law. So I like a big family. I want somebody to, you know, visit with, somebody to borrow something from. <laughs> somewhere to go eat dinner for free. <laughs> and so I wanted a big family. So we grew up in the mountains of East Tennessee, and that was just what you did. You just had a lot of kids to put to work because uh, we lived in the Appalachian Mountains, and so uh, we had a 400-acre farm. We worked. Uh, we didn't have McDonald's or Arby's. We didn't have a drive-in movie. We only had about 750 people in our little town, and the town was 12 miles away. So we're in the country country. And so I grew up that way, and I loved it. And so I wanted my kids to experience that. So when I got married, uh, um, I was working as an engineer, had a great job. Then God did one about ministry, so I quit my job as an engineer, went back to school again, got on the church staff, and uh, became the education director. And so uh, we had three kids at the time. We had three more while we were on staff. And then for the last 29 years, we've traveled all over America teaching on family, marriage, and parenting because I saw something real quick. Now, I was what we call a process engineer. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm a process. People hired me to fix stuff. In other words, a company hires me. Uh, I work for three companies, uh, three different companies, four years each. A company hires me to help them do better. And so they think they're not doing good. So they hire me and I come in. I have one year to improve the process. A year from now, we better be making more money with the product we're making. We better be making a better product and better have better quality. So I'm to improve the process. So I was trained in those 12 years for ministry. So when I got on church staff, you know, it was kind of a new world. And I, I didn't know what church staff, I didn't know what they did. I don't know what, I just knew they showed up on Sunday. I don't know what they do in the middle of the week. I just figured you sit down and drink coffee and wait on Sunday. But no, you don't, you know. They work you like a dog. Boy, God bless them. So, and I mean that, God bless them. Anyhow, uh, so when we started traveling, I noticed something on the church staff. Uh, people's families were just messed up. They're born again, spirit filled. Praying the Holy Ghost, we believed in healing and miracles, but in the middle of the week, the families of our church, we had about 3,000 people at the time, they'd show up and, man, their marriages are falling apart, their kids are on drugs, they're fornicating, they're getting drunk, like, and that was our, those were our people, that wasn't the world, those were our people. I thought, man, we got a problem, and so we need to have a class, so we started a class on Sunday evening on marriage building 101, then we started one on parenting, and, and so for eight and a half years, that's what we did every Sunday afternoon. Well, during those eight and a half years, I learned a lot. I learned I didn't, I didn't know anything. <laughs> and I learned I was a doofus. And so, well, we got to fix this. And so, I realized uh, we started 29 years ago. We stepped out and we started traveling. And uh, the first year, I think we did 75 seminars the first year because we didn't have any competition. There are only three national ministries that taught on marriage or family because nobody will do it because they think you have to have a perfect family to teach on family. Nobody has a perfect family. So we're all qualified. And so uh, three national ministries, and so one of them, the, unfortunately, he died went to heaven, so they dropped out of family ministry. Another one, an older guy from California, uh, he, he had an affair on his wife, and he was like 68. And he messed up, and well, he's out of ministry. And so we moved to the head of the food chain. And so, so we had no competition. There's nobody to compete with us. And so people would call and say, hey, you come teach on marriage? Yeah. Hey, can you come teach on marriage? In 29 years, nobody ever asked me my credentials, ever. Nobody asked me about my, my degree or where I learned it. Hey, can you teach on marriage? Mm -hmm. Would you please come? 
I was in the First Baptist Church of Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee, and we'd done a Friday, Saturday seminar on marriage. We were down in this big old building, beautiful building. And so we're finishing up Saturday afternoon. I got to catch a plane to go to Jacksonville, Florida to start this thing on Sunday morning. So we're eating our cheesecake. We're in these tables. All the couples had stayed, and we're eating our dessert. And so I'm sitting right next to the pastor, and he said, uh, I understand you went to a seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I said, yeah. He said, I don't know the Baptist had any seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I thought, uh-oh. I said, well, they don't. Now, where'd you go to Bible school, Bill? I went to a little two-year knee knocker school called Rainbow Bible Training Center, and then I went three summers to Old Roberts University. It got quiet. Everybody stopped eating. He is, he's 18 inches from my face. He said, you're not a Baptist? <laughs> well, Pastor, I grew up Baptist. All my family's Baptist. I'm still on the church road. They didn't take my name off. But no, I'm, I'm not a Baptist. Well, what are you? <laughs> well, we have a lot of names for it. Pentecostal word of faith, you know, charismatic. And it went dead quiet. And I'm not exaggerating this. Was, he's just staring at me. He said, well, if I'd have known that, I would not have invited you. I thought, well, help me, Jesus. I don't have my check yet either. I thought, well, I said, this ain't going to go good. <laughs> I thought, so I don't know what to say. So I said, well, how was it? He stared me just for a few seconds. He said, pretty good. He went back to eating his cheesecake. Well, I went back the next year. It worked out really good. So I've learned I don't want anybody to know who I'm, where I am, where I went to school, where I'm from. I just want to blend in because my job is to teach them parenting and marriage because the last days God promised he'd pour out his spirit on all flesh. Our sons and daughters have prophesied, dream dreams, have vision. That is the greatest time of human history to be alive. Now, two years ago when the thing hit, you know, somebody in Wuhan, China let something out of a jar and they shut Disney down. They had never closed Disney. In the history of Disney, Disney had never closed, but somebody in Wuhan shut them down. So for three months, we couldn't fly. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't travel. Everybody's terrified, and, and so it's a, it's a new disease. Now, this is me, so pastor will clean up anything I say when he gets back. There is no new disease. There's nothing new under the sun. Same devil, same same, you know, he steals, kills, and destroys. He's not changed. There is not a new flu. There's the same flu. Give it a different name. There's been the flu's been around since day one. People, my my grandmother used to wear garlic around her neck to keep the flu away. She never got it. <laughs> I don't know if it worked. You could smell her three rooms away. <laughs> and so, you know, we did a lot of that mountain stuff. And so I've had family members uh, in the last two years. I had uh, two family members die of the flu. You know, they said, well, they had the COVID and they died. I said, well, they died, but it, it, it's just the flu. It's, the flu will kill you. You need to stay healthy and drink your orange juice, take your vitamins, and, you know, stay healthy, drink your water. And the worst thing we do, we don't drink enough water. And so I realized there's stuff to deal with. So I taught history for years and uh, when I was an administrator of school. And so... I've told people, let's just take it this real slow. Now, this is not the sermon. It's a short sermon. I've got to give a long introduction. <laughs> in, in, in 29, when the stock market crashed in the 20s, uh, people committed suicide. People in New York City jumped off buildings and killed themselves. The same year, people in New York City became billionaires. When some people were killing themselves, others were getting filthy, stinking rich. World War I broke out, and they thought it's the end of the world. Grandmothers in Kansas were praying, the end of the world's come. This is it. The nations are raising up against one another. It's just like Revelation. It's the end of the world. So, no, it's just World War I. We'll whip them. We'll get them everything back. Well, a few years go by, World War II breaks out. Germans are trying to take over the world. They thought, well, this is definitely the end of the world. This is the end of the world. No, no. We've got some goofball in Germany went crazy. We'll finally get him put back where he needs to be. And then, you know, and, and then it was... Uh, and every year, about every two or three or something to break out. I remember back in 78 uh, when the, the oil prices, the oil embargo happened. Gasoline in my city was 27 cents a gallon. I was a senior in high school. We paid 27 cents a gallon. And all of a sudden, OPEC went on the wharf path, and it jumped a dollar in just a few days. It went to, from 27 cents to a dollar 27 a gallon. 
My dad wouldn't drive to work. He said, it'll kill America. We cannot survive with a dollar twenty-seven gallon. And so, well, little did we know where it's going. <laughs> God didn't die. He didn't fall off the throne. Gas prices just went up. And you have to realize the last days, there's a lot of scripture about the last days. In the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, heady, high-minded, truce breakers, unthankful, unholy, without natural effects. It's all happening in the news. At the same time, the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Yeah. The sons of God is going to prophesy and dream dreams and have visions. You and I, for whatever reason, have been allowed to live in the greatest day of human history. Yes. Now, when the, Wuhan, when the Wuhan thing hit, my phone lights up because I'm the only preacher in the family and I'm Pentecostal. So, uh, 24 brothers and sisters between my dad and my father I'm the only preacher in the bunch and I'm Pentecostal. And it messes with them. They don't invite me to nothing. Unless they die or get married, then they invite me because I'm free. <laughs> and so, Paul Little says, and it's, then it's Brother Joe. Brother Joe, what do you think's going on in China? Well, somebody opened a jar and let something out. They'll get it back in eventually. You think it's the end of the world? No, it's not the end. We're getting close, but it's not the end. Now, I'm an old history thing, you know. When Israel became a nation in 1948, we got a 100-year countdown. This is me. Pastor, clean this up when he gets back. <laughs> and I love your pastor. He is a good, 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 good man. He's rare. And so, so anyhow, in 48, we got 100 years. Well, that's it's 2048. Back off seven years for the tribulation. Somewhere around 2041, 42, <laughs> Trump's going to say, we're going to heaven. Yeah, for years when I was an engineer back in the late 80s, we got off into the dumbest stuff. We read books like the Illuminati, Rockefeller Files, 666. We were messed up. I just I ran for political office, uh, became county chair of a political party. I made the nominating speech for the governor of Oklahoma. I got in deep. We registered people to vote in our church. We registered 1,200 people in just one year. 3,000 people, 1,200 weren't even registered to vote. They didn't vote. They weren't even registered to vote. And I thought... We're supposed to vote, people. You can't put bumper stickers in your car and change anything. You got to vote. Well, I'll leave you the one of them. Well, vote for one of them. You got to pick somebody. Well, that was deep. <laughs> and so I've been through this whole mess. I said, listen, there's nothing new under the sun. For whatever reason, God said, let's just look at this. I taught kids for years. Let's go back in time. Say we go back to the beginning of time, whatever that is. We're here in the beginning. There's no heaven, no earth yet, just God. God's hanging out, and God says, son, I'm getting ready to make everything, so I want you to watch this. So there's no time in heaven. God looks out in two time. God sees me five seconds from now. God sees me five minutes from now. He sees me five hours from now. God sees me five days from now, five years. God sees the future. He won't make it happen, but he sees it happening. So if you can go back in time like he did to John off the Isle of Patmos, he, took the, he showed John Revelation. Revelation hadn't happened yet, but he showed it to John. Son, write this down. This is about to happen. He showed him the future because God sees and knows everything. Nothing shocks God. Nothing takes God by surprise. Whatever's going on, God saw it coming before your mother ever met your father. God's in control. You got to watch who you're feeding. You can't feed on the world. I know Angel and I, we, we moved to Florida a year ago, and, uh, and we did this when we first got married uh, five years ago. We got rid of all the, all the internet and the TV. Got to get this stuff out of the house. Now, we have a big, huge screen TV in our living room in Florida. Big. I mean, it's like, whoa. That's big. And we watch old movies. So I like, I like to watch old movies. I watch old movies. Most of them are black and white. Because when they made black and white movies, the good guy always won. <laughs> now they made stupid movies where you never know who wins, wins to the end. I remember my kids, my daughter was a senior at Old Roberts University. We were bringing some kids home for Christmas. They couldn't afford to go home for Christmas, so we're going to bring them home to our house and going to keep them about five days, have a hayride and cook out and just give them a Christmas of some kind. So we're in Blockbuster Video when it was still in business. So we go in, and so I asked my daughter, what are we renting? That's packed. Two days before Christmas, place is packed. What kind of movies were we renting? She said, we're renting. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Yeah, that's funny. I like that. What else are we renting? Well, Dad, we're renting the Titanic. The new Titanic just come out. I said, the Titanic. He said, Dad, we got a VCR that screens out all the sex and the cuss words. And it's, I said, had they changed the end of that movie? And Sarah, she's my oldest. She's a college professor today. She said, what? I said, does that boat still sink in that movie? <laughs> well, yes, Dad, it's the Titanic. I said, how long is that movie? It's three hours. Baby, I'd rather go home and shove a toothpick under my fingernail <laughs> and sit there for three hours and pay $8 and watch that boat sink. 
am I there? I said, well, it's a true story. Yeah, people burning hell is a true story. I won't watch that either. They'd be in heaven eating dinner and saddling my horse, coming back with Jesus. I don't watch stupid. I don't feed stupid. I don't listen to stupid. I don't sing stupid. There's an old great movie, Stupid Is the Stupid Does, and that's somewhere in the Bible. Watch what you feed on because the devil's a liar. John 10, 10, he steals, he kills, he destroys. Guard your heart with all diligence for every issues of life. If I get someone in a five-minute conversation, I'll mark them. Because so whatever you've been feeding on will come out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. You've got to guard your heart. We live in a great time, but it, there's lots of stupidity going on. Well, don't feed on stupidity. Feed on the good. I remember after that thing, two years, getting involved in politics, I got out. Now, I still vote. I still pray for all those positions of authority, including our current president. People say, you pray for our president? I pray for him every day. Dear Lord, he needs prayer. I pray for him every day. God bless him. Help him out. Send labors across his path. Talk to me. Go to sleep when he gets up. So, you know, God had Daniel pray for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had killed Daniel's parents, burned down his house, killed his pet goat, made him a slave. And God says to Daniel, hey, I need you to pray for Nebuchadnezzar. I'll pray, I'll pray, she bear rip his head, I'll spit down his throat. <laughs> no, wrong prayer, wrong prayer. I need you to pray that he has a peaceful day. A what? Yeah, he's praying Nebuchadnezzar has a peaceful day. Looks like he's going to get saved, turn into evangelist. No, he's going to go stupid and eat grass for seven years. He's going he's to turn into an idiot. But he'll come back eventually. But I need you to pray for him. Because if he has a peaceful day, you'll have a peaceful day. But if he doesn't have a peaceful day, you're probably coming to heaven early. <laughs> we are the salt and the light of our planet. We're the salt and light of our country. How's America doing? Well, how's the church doing? You go to a country where the church doesn't exist, you'll walk into hell. You got to go where the church exists. We are the, we're what's happening. We're the light. We're the salt. We're, we're turning good things, uh, bad things into good things. That's what we do. We're a blessing, looking for a place to happen. So every day you get up, what is it? It's going to be a great day. I'm trying to imagine them interviewing Jesus. I'm trying to imagine CNN was back around. You know, they've been around forever anyhow. So I'm trying to imagine Jesus during his three and a half years of ministry. CNN shows up one day and says, hey, Jesus, I've uh, been hearing a lot about you. Uh, what do you have planned today? <laughs> Jesus said, well, i got a busy day planned. Uh, first thing this morning, I'm going to put some eyeballs on a blind man's head. <laughs> They're going to get excited about that. They're going to drag him down to the Sanhedrin. They're going to grill him, and they're going to ask him, you believe this guy's a son of God? And he's going to say, I don't know. All I was once I was blind, and now I see. He didn't become a preacher. He just got his eyeballs back. Then later on today, Jesus said, I'm going into town. I'm going to raise a dead kid at a funeral. Oh, they're going to write songs about that one. <laughs> then later on this afternoon, I'm going here on the hillside, and I'm going to create 5,000 Happy Meals. Whoa, they're going to like that. <laughs> What's Jesus doing? He's fixing busted stuff. Jesus said, the things I do, shall you do also. We live in the greatest day of human history. Wouldn't it be sad to go to heaven and meet the heroes of faith, Joshua and Moses, Jephthah, and they ask you, man, what was it like in the last days when God's spirit was poured out without measure? Well, heart, well, heart. Guess what I found in the gallon? My wife left me. My mom fired me. My dog bit me. It was heart. That won't go over good in heaven. <laughs> when I went to family reunions, you knew you'd made it when you got to sit at the big table. We had a huge big table my grandfather made. If you're a kid, you sit at a card table somewhere. You don't eat off a real plate. You eat off a paper plate. You don't get any real chicken. You get a sticky little chicken leg. You a chicken leg person. And you don't get any real drink. You get Kool-Aid, paper plate, and a chicken leg. You a chicken leg Christian. I'm trying to imagine you get to heaven, you're going to see a lot of people with a check leg around their neck. Because you're going to get to heaven. When you get there, they're going to open up the books. First of all, Lamb's Book of Life, you say, okay, you get to stay. And then the book of works. What did you do in faith, out of faith, in love, out of love when you're on earth? And they're going to read that off to you. The Bible says, I'll give an account of every idle word, every idle deed. An angel's watching me and he's writing it all down. There's no secrets with God. If I even think stupid, an angel writes that down. I'll give an account of every idle thought. You got to control what you think and what you do and what you say. God's given us the tools, but we have to do it. Wouldn't it be a shame to get to heaven? <laughs> and you go, well, where's my mantle? Well, son, you don't have a mansion. You're a chicken leg Christian. Hang this chicken leg around your neck. You get to hold the door of somebody else's mansion. 
And so you, you, not every mansion's the same size. This isn't government housing. <laughs> there's different size mansions. In there. You read in your Bible, I'm not making this up. There's different size mansions based on what you've done on earth. I'm laying out treasure in heaven about what I do here, how I treat people here, what I think say here. It's laying out treasure in heaven. So you get to heaven, what's that? That's what I did on earth. Well, some people won't have anything. They get to stay. St. Peter's going to meet the, the golden. Well, son, you get to stay, but you don't have nothing. Hang this chicken leg around your neck. You're a chicken leg, Christian. We get to hold the door of somebody else's mansion. People think you're making that up. No, I'm not. There's levels of treasure in heaven. So let's start living for God now. Let's start thinking right now. Quit feeding on stupid now. Read your Bible every day. <laughs> well, that would be deep, wouldn't it? Whoa. Yeah, got a proverb for every day of the month, man. It's got you set up right there. If you read a proverb every day, you'll be smarter than 99% of most people on this planet. Yes, you will. It's the word that changes everything. Changes everything. This ministry is based on the word of God. It's, that's what it's based on. And it saves so many lives. I mean, man, have mercy. She gets to heaven. Big match. Now, this is not a commercial, but I'm going to hold these up. During the three-month code where we couldn't travel, I went to the office. And so Angel went to the office. So you're going to lay anybody off? We're not laying nobody off. We're about to work you like a dog. And so this, we traveled so much, we didn't have time to write some books. So we wrote three books during the three months. Well, this is one up. I should have written this book 40 years ago, but I didn't. This is the greatest book I ever wrote. Greatest book I ever wrote. It's called Four Kinds of Kids. Proverbs 1. There's four kinds of kids. Wise, simple, foolish, and scornful. Wise kids live a long time. Filthy, stinking rich, have honor of the king, uh, can scale the wall of the city, take a captive. Nothing bad happens to a wise child. Well, how do you get a wise kid? I prayed every day, Psalm 34, 11. I prayed at this one, Father, I give you permission. Teach my children to fear you. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. With that wisdom, it's long life, riches, and honor, Proverbs three sixteen. What do you want? Long life, riches, and honor for all my kids. How are they going to get that? They need to fear God. I'll pray it before I go to bed tonight. When I land... When I landed in my town tonight, uh, I'll go get in my bed probably about 1 o'clock. And before I close my eyes, James and I will pray for our kids. Father, we give you permission. Teach our children to fear you. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. With that wisdom is long life, riches, and honor. I pray it twice a day. I pray it my whole life. I'll pray it the last day I'm here. God moves. Now, this book is nothing but scripture. You can get a Bible from the Gideons and get this for free. If you get this book, it's going to cost you 8 bucks. This, book, this book's $8, okay? But all the stuff in this book came for free out of a, a Gideon's Bible. So get you a Gideon's Bible for free or spend $8 to get my book. <laughs> I'm trying to let that sink in. <laughs> it's nothing but Scripture. It's nothing but Scripture. It's nothing but Scripture. But feel good. Because if you're not wise, you're simple-minded. You're not evil. You're not full of the devil. You're just a doofus. If you stay a doofus too long, you become stage three. You become a fool. The Bible said it's sport for a fool to make mischief. Fools have a lot of potential, but they never reach it. A, a fool's like a dog who puts his guts out and eats it again. Oh, tons of scriptures about it. And if you stay a fool too long, you become a scorner. Scorners hate those that love them. They have the ability to get everybody around them in trouble but not get caught themselves. They're gang leaders. You don't want, you don't want those last three. You only want a wise child. That's the only kind you want. People, I don't have perfect kids. There are no perfect children because there's no perfect parents. But there's smart ones. There's wise ones. Three kinds. A man's got three jobs. Somebody asked about that, so I brought it up here. Uh, we have three jobs. All men are lovers. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What's your job? Love your wife. How? Like Christ loved you. Jesus loved me when I wasn't lovable. Jesus loved me when I was headed for hell in the handbasket. Jesus loved me into this relationship. Men, you're going to love your wife. A marriage is a funeral. Hallmark's got the cards all wrong. <laughs> it should say, I'm so sorry I heard you got married. Because if you don't die at that ceremony, you're a half-dead zombie. Because at that ceremony, you're swearing before God, hopefully, and witnesses from this day forward, I'm with this woman right here. Now, I'm on my second marriage, and it's great. Because I'm a really, really, really good husband. Because I learned the first time through. First three years of my first marriage, we yelled, hollered, screamed, cussed at one another, threw stuff at one another. Because we were doofuses. 
Well, we got spirit filled, saved and spirit filled. Well, the next six years are pretty good. And so nine years in my first marriage, my wife's washing dishes one day and I said, I just realized something. And she turned around and she said, what's that? I said, you're not going to change, are you? <laughs> she said, is that a revelation to you? Yeah. I've been working trying to say, no, Joe, I'm not going to change. I said, well, praise God. That's going to free up a lot of time. I should have been wasting a lot of time trying to change you. Since you're not going to change, I'll just work on me. <laughs> she said, that'd be a God idea. And there's where my marriage changed. So the rest of my marriage was wonderful. Wasn't perfect, but it was wonderful. This marriage, I made my mind up. This lady came into my life, and uh, I married an angel. And uh, now this is me. This is me. I've never picked a restaurant in five years of marriage. And we were first made sure where you want to go eat. Wherever you want to eat. What are you in the mood for? Whatever you're in the mood for. Uh, we bought uh, three cars. I've never bought a car, ever. So we need a car. Go get one. We've owned two houses. I've never bought a one. So we got to get a house. Go get one. You want to go? No, I'll just mess it up. No. <laughs> so a year ago, she said, Joe, we need to move to Florida. And uh, her kids all live in Florida, and their mom had some health issues, so we need to go down and help them out. Uh, she said, well, uh, we need to go to Florida. Let's go. Well, we need to sell the house. Okay, sell it. You don't care? No, I'm with you. Whatever you want to do. So uh, Brother Hagen's uh, uh, daughter-in-law is the real estate agent there in Tulsa. She's real good. We called her uh, Tuesday evening. She had the home sold on Wednesday morning. We made a lot of money on the house, too. <laughs> Houses are going good. So he said that. He said, Joe, I'm going to Florida to get a house. You want to go with me? I said, no, baby. What kind of house you want? Whatever you like. Just go get something. And so two days later, she called, Joe, I found a house. And I said, okay, you want to come see it? No, I'll see it when we move in. And so I didn't see our house, so we moved in. Now, we live on the north side of Lakeland, Florida. Now, Lakeland's a beautiful town, five college campuses, old town, brick streets, beautiful old town, and uh, right in the middle of the state. And so uh, Florida's got lots of rednecks. <laughs> it's full of cowboys. We got cows. So we got, we're the ninth leading cattle producing state in America. We got cows and cowboys everywhere in the middle of the state. Not on the coast where all the hippies and the tourists are. In, in the middle of the state, the rednecks. And so it's a very redneck town, and we got five universities, and so it's just a great place. So we live on a dead end road in the middle of nowhere because we lived in a, I never lived in a gated community. I was in one for about a year, and it just drove me nuts. I don't want somebody to tell me what I can do and not do. It's my house. And so we got from when a dead end road out in the middle of the country with a lot of redneck relatives uh, that live next to us. Just, I mean, hillbillies. My neighbor's got more guns than the, the he's, more, he's military. He'll shoot them every now and then. And so my house is beautiful. I have the most beautiful home on that stretch of road there. And so we're backed up against the reserve. There's 300 acres behind us you can't build because they're trying to preserve some bird or something. You know, they can't, can't mess with it. So we have gators everywhere. There's alligators everywhere, everywhere. There's water. It's called Lake Reeds. There's lakes everywhere. So I, I drove my wife nuts. Is there a gator? Joe, if there's water in Alabama, if there's water down here, there's a gator in it. And if there's not one, it's because he ate all the other gators out. He went to another pond to eat those gators. <laughs> and they got big gators. They're some big ones. So, I mean, for months, I'd go out of my house with a flashlight. And my wife said, what are you doing? So I'm looking for a gator. I don't know a gator come up and car and bite my foot off. She said, well, no gators here. No, that's what you say. I'm not taking any chances. So I don't, look the, I don't use the flashlight anymore. I trust, trust my wife. So anyhow, I got a beautiful home with a big old shrimp in my backyard, no neighbors, and uh, I really love it. And how'd you get that? My wife. I, what you, well, she picked it out. She knows I like to swim. I got my own office. I got 12-foot ceiling, three glass doors to look out at in my pool. How'd you get that? My wife. Did you pick this up? No, I don't pick nothing out. When we go on vacation, <laughs> she said, where you want to go? I don't care. I'm going with you. So we went to the Grand Bah. We met some great vacation. People gave them to her. She's got a gift on her. So I went to the Grand Bahamas. I've never been to the Grand Bahamas. you got to drive on the wrong side of the road. And they're a foreign country. They're a foreign country. And so we had a great time down there. So where'd you go? Wherever she says. Where'd you eat? Wherever she wants to. Where you live? Where she says. What are you wearing? Whatever she bought me. <laughs> I, changed my, I changed my shoelaces because I had white shoelaces. She said, Joe, don't you wear those white shoelaces on that stage? Okay. So I had some black shoelaces in my suitcase, and I changed them out this morning. That's my wife. 
Okay, that's the introduction. <laughs> this is going to help you. This is Numbers 13. You go back to Exodus. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he said, uh, Exodus 13, verse 17, he said, I'm going to have to take them the long way around to the promised land. There was a shorter route to the promised land. God said, I can't take them the short route. There's too much opposition. I'm going to take the long route and so they won't run into any of the opposition because if they run into opposition, they're not strong yet. They'll turn back and they'll run back into Egypt. I said, I know them. They're mine. And so that's what he did. They took the long way across the Red Sea. Why? Because God took the long route with, so they wouldn't run into opposition. God knows what you need, what I need. He's going to lead us every day. He'll order our steps. He'll direct our paths. Whatever you're facing, you have the ability to take care of it. God saw it coming. God's not shocked. So here it is. Five-minute sermon. It's real good. Numbers uh, chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord said, I'm in the New Living Translation, by the way. The Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each tribe. And that's what he did. Down verse uh, 17, Moses gave the men these instructions. Go north to explore the land. Go through the Negev, the hill country. See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land is it? Is it good land? Is it bad land? Do the towns have walls? Are they unprotected? Are they open camps? Is the soil fertile? Is it poor? I mean, God's detail. Check it out. Twelve men, one from each tribe, going into the promise. They're gone for 40 days. They're going to spy it out. On the way back, four days about up, it says, when they came to the valley of Esho, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large it two, took two men to carry them on a pole between them. Now, if you land in Tel Aviv, I've been to Israel several times, if you land in Tel Aviv Airport, there's a brass statue, two grown men with a cluster of grapes that look like cantaloupes. They're as big as cantaloupes. They're grapes. It's called the promised land. God said, you're going to live in the houses you did not build. You leave from vineyards you did not plant. I'm trying to bless you, you thumb-sucking, sinning people. I'm trying to bless you. I want the world to ask you about the hope that's in you. Say, it's not us. It's all God, man. This is an all God thing. God was trying to show off with one group of people. He wanted the world to look and see that I'm good, but I got to find a group of people to show off through. Of course, they kept messing up, you know. So they come back with a cluster of grapes, and uh, it's, man, they got all kinds of pomegranates, and it's just, you can read it on your own, but it's just great. So they come back, and here it is. Here's the sermon. They come back and said, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses. They reported to the whole community. Now, there's two and a half million people that have been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Two and a half men are waiting on this side of the river to hear what these 12 men saw. They're coming to give their report. We entered the land you sent us to explore. It is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the fruit that it produces, but... The people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We saw giants there, the sense of Anak. You know, this is fallen angels and humans. They're not normal. And uh, he said, the Canaanites live there and along the Mediterranean Sea, the Hittites, the Jebusites. But Caleb tried to quiet the people. They stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who explored the land says, no, they disagreed. We can't go against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anybody that goes there. All the people we saw there were huge. We even saw giants in the descendants of Anak. <laughs> Next to them, we looked like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too with the jazz. Hey, big boy, what do I look like? You look like a grasshopper. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back and share that. Now, need to read the next two chapters, but here it is. This. So the, the Bible says, 10 brought back an evil report. Two brought back a good report. 12 men went in. They all saw the same stuff, ate the same food, slept in the same place. When they came back, 10 gave an evil report. Two gave a good report. 10 gave an evil report. Two gave good. It's Nothing's changed. Every company I've ever worked for, for every 10 people in a room, nine saw negative, one saw something good. Every church I've ever worked on, everybody in the church board office, nine saw something bad, one saw something good. Good's rare. 
because it takes faith. Because okay, so listen, we can take that land. We're more than able. Why? God's with us, not with them. That's why David killed Goliath. He's a half breed between a fallen angel and a human. He's dead where he stands. David told Saul, he's dead where he stands. I'll take him out. You can't do that, kid. You just a kid. No, I can take him out. Of course, he chopped his head off that day. It was a great victory, and he became famous. All the women wanted to date him. <laughs> they made a movie about it. It's really good. So the mama says, the people heard it, and they began to wail and cry. The two and a half million, oh, if it only died in Egypt. Oh, if it only died in the wilderness. Oh, God's brought us here to kill us. In every group, in every family, in every business, every group of people, nine out of ten see negative. We can't do it. It's too hard. Wuhan let something out. They closed Disney. We're all going to die. <laughs> well, if you want to, go ahead and go to heaven. I'm going to stick around. Now, my dad was one of 12. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but let's tell it like it is. Uh, our little country town, we had an embalmer. We did not have a funeral home. So if somebody died, you go to his house, he'd fix the body up. Then they'd bring the cast to your house that evening and roll it in their living room, push the couch out of the way, and push the casket, lift up the lid, and we'd sit up with the dead. We're good Southern Baptists. We'd sit up with the dead. Sit up all night, eat fried chicken, baked beans, potato salad, Talk about them real good to about midnight. Then your belly get full of food. And then you start bad, man. No good north end of southbound biscuit eating. No good son of a gun. You know, then by the time the sun came up, you up bad. Oh, dear Lord, I got to repent. Let's stick them in the ground. And it helped the grieving process because you set up with the dead. Because you said everything you knew to say and some you shouldn't have said. And by sun up, we were wore out like, dear God, put them in the ground. I need a nap. And so... I see people all over the country that where somebody's dying in a car wreck, whatever, they got crossed on the side of the road and flowers. Listen, people, they're gone. They're, they're gone. I love my first wife. I love that woman. She died unexpectedly. Got a brain tumor, stage four cancer. Three months later, she was gone. Never had any pain, just went out and took the tumor out and grew back bigger. And she died in her sleep. I was right there next to her when she died. And so... For six weeks, I couldn't stop crying. Believe it or not, I lost 51 pounds. I couldn't eat. I couldn't stop crying. I cried all the time. My kids said, Dad, I just, I hold me just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. So six weeks after my wife died, I woke up on a Saturday morning, and I heard God talk to me. <laughs> now, you don't have to believe this, but I heard God talk to me. He said, get up, shut up, and get busy. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, that was six years ago. I have not cried about my wife one time. Not once. When I married Angel, she'll ask her now, you ever think about your first wife? No. Ever? No. Why do you think that is? She died. She's gone. She's in heaven, having a good time, eating good food, it's air conditioned, never gets dark. <laughs> They're fellowshipping. She's not thinking about me. I'm still here. She ain't worried about me. She's in heaven. I'm still here. And so I thought, I got to get busy living today, but then God's not through with me. I got stuff to do. And so I tell people, uh, I was standing next to that cat at my first funeral at my grandmother's house. I was seven. My dad would always do the same to bring me over the cat. These are all, all my great aunts and uncles. They've died. So come on, tell your Aunt Ella bye. So I went over, and so they got in the casket. Well, my aunts are from, they're from Appalachia. They don't wear makeup. They didn't wear underwear. They're country women. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling the truth. They're country women. And so they had her to paint it up like a $3 street walker. It's like, she never wore makeup. What do you got to paint it up like Bozo the Clown for? And that's what, tell her about, he, would, he made me touch the dead. I could never be in the priest in Old Testament. I've touched too many dead people. So I remember I touched her. It's like, they froze her. What'd they do to her? Hard as a rock. And I had a revelation when I was seven. I had this revelation. I'm about through. Hold on just a minute. I'm about through. And I thought, I'm seven, I thought, oh, dear Lord, that's where we end up. That's where we're all headed. A box eight foot in the ground. <laughs> Man, I better get busy living because every day that goes by, the day you don't get back. And I made a 
conscious decision at age seven next to my first dead great aunt. And I said, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. I'm going to live to the max every day. I'm going to go everywhere I can, do everything I can, you know, learn everything I can. I'm going to live life to the fullest. And so I'd have people, now I had old relatives sit on the front porch and they'd talk about, uh, I think I got that flu thing. I think I got that disease. I think, and I remember my, my father-in-law, he, he was 97 before he ever died. He shouldn't have died then. And uh, the women were talking about menopause in the kitchen. He couldn't hear real good. And he said, well, what is that? And they were talking about going through menopause. I think I got that. I'm not making this a, and they just laugh. You can't, yeah, that's exactly what I got. I, I think I got that. He thought he had every disease that ever came down the pike. Well, he lived forever. The point is, the point is, uh, Moses and Aaron threw their face on the ground because the people want to kill him. Let's kill Moses and Aaron. Let's kill them. Let's find a leader to take us back into Egypt. Let's find a leader who will take us back into slavery. Let's find a leader who will take us back into poverty. Let's take a leader who will take us into having nothing, stomping mud, making bricks. Let's take a leader who will take us back. Humans have not changed. They want to be safe. There is no safe place. It's called heaven. Till we get there, we're here on an alien planet. Hence, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is the legal temporary God of earth. That's why prisons are full, hospitals are full, orphans. What's going on? Hell's in charge. Now I'm the family preaching. I remember I did a funeral one time. I was down in Midland Odessa. I did a funeral for an uncle. He died early. He shouldn't have had, about 53. So I'm standing there and I'm shaking hands. People filing by the casket where go to the graveside service. His brother comes up. And everybody whispers like the dead, you're going to wake the dead up. <laughs> so I'm the preacher. I've done the service. His brother comes and shakes my hand. His brother's there in the castle. And he leans and says, well, Brother Joe, I guess God needed them in heaven. And I just squeezed him. Him, No, God didn't need him in heaven. He wasn't any good to anybody down here. <laughs> he didn't make it to the graveside service. He's not talked to me since. He got mad at me. Only thing worse than being a preacher is being a lying preacher. You got to tell the truth. Truth sets you free. So I've told my kids their whole life, you, for whatever reason, have been allowed to live in the greatest day of human history. And people call me all the, Brother Jones, this is a good time to get married. Perfect time to get married. Brother Jones, this is a good time to have kids. Perfect time to have kids. Have a boatload of kids. Never been a better time to get married, to have kids, to start a business, start a family. It is God's time. It is the greatest day. So you stay busy till you hear that. And once you hear that, we're out of here. We're going to go eat dinner and saddle a horse. And then we got a thousand years of great stuff after that. We're flying out of Jerusalem. It's, a, it's in the Bible. Not a lot about it, but it's enough to get you excited. You and I live in the greatest time of history. Please don't get caught up in the stuff the world's throwing at you. They're going to throw disease and terror and famine. Got a new disease. Economy's bad. Jesus said when he comes back to this earth to get the church, people be eating, drinking, marrying, giving a marriage, buying, selling, Building and planning. Jesus said, unless he lied, Jesus said it'll be business as usual the day he splits the sky to come get the church. Economy's not going to collapse. America's not going to go under. Now, once we leave, it's going to get skanky, but not while we're here. We're the body of Christ. We're here at the greatest times. So let's enjoy the process. And let's be a blessing to somebody. Amen. Let's stand up. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that sets us free and keeps us free. Today we say, Father, if we are blinded in any area, take that blindness from our minds. Enlighten the eyes of understanding. Talk to us when we go to sleep. Talk to us when we get up. Talk to us when we walk during the day. Father, we thank you that you've allowed us, for whatever reason, to be alive in the greatest time of human history. Put us in the middle of what you want us to do in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Every head bowed just for 60 seconds. Nobody moving for 60 seconds. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Two questions. Are you here this morning? He said, Joe, I do not know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I have never, ever asked him into my heart, but I think God's been dealing with me, and I'd like to do something about that this morning. Well, if that's you, I would like to pray a 30-second prayer out of Romans over you. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you forward. Men don't save men. God saves men. But if that's you in just a few seconds, I'm simply going to ask you to raise your hand, wave it at me, and put it right back down. I'm going to see it. God's going to see it. If you're willing to acknowledge you need a Savior, God in heaven will save you right where you stand. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. 
God will make you a new creature in Christ. It'll never get easier than this. Or perhaps you're here and say, Joe, I'm saved. I just haven't been living for God lately. But I've been stirred this morning. I'm ready to get serious with Jesus. Well, if that's you, you can pray the exact same prayer. We're going to pray with these other people out of Romans. And God in heaven will forgive you every sin you've ever committed in a moment of time. He will take your sin as far as the east is from the west. He'll put it in the depths of the sea. There'll be no record of your sin in heaven. And God will make the devil pay back seven times whatever he stole from it. It will never get these this. So with every head bowed, every eye closed to Joe, that's me. I need to get saved. Would you pray that prayer for me or Joe? That's me. I want to rededicate my life. If that's you on either count right now, would you simply get your hand up, wave it down, and put it back down, Joe? Brother Joe, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? It'll never get easy with this. God does the saving. God does the forgiving. He just needs our permission. Anyone else before we pray, Joe? I'm not raising my hand yet. Please include me in your prayer. All right, hands down, heads bowed, and eyes closed. Here's what we're going to do. I saw three hands go up, and we're going to help them pray. God's going to do the two greatest miracles he can do. He's going to save souls and forgive sins. So, people, let's help them pray. Everybody in here say this after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I do believe he is your son. He died for me, and you raised him from the dead. I ask him now. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you by faith with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Now, Father, for the hands that went up this morning, either for the first time ever or as a simple reaffirmation of their faith in you, according to your holy word and their obedience, is right now they are cleansed, forgiven, blood bought, born again, children of God. Jesus Christ is their Lord. The devil's not their Lord anymore. They are your sheep. You're their shepherd. They're going to hear your voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Lord, as they lead today, surround them with divine favor. May people begin to look at them with a new set of eyes. And Father, bring godly friends into their life that will strike iron and cause them to grow and become all you want them to be. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap, people.